Good morning, everyone. Um, Matt stole the notes from my first slide. Um, my name is Scott Francis. I am from Shopify, and today I'm going to be talking about how we moved from the data center to the cloud. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I work for Shopify, uh, based in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, I've been at Shopify a little more than five years now. Uh, to give you an idea of how fast Shopify is growing, um, I joined in 2013, which is longer than 97.37% of employees. Um, so we are, we are growing pretty quick. So what is Shopify? Shopify is not Spotify. Um, this is something that people always get confused with. Um, but we are one of the world's largest commerce companies. Uh, we help entrepreneurs sell their products uh, through a variety of channels. Could be uh, online on the web, through point of sale, or through social media. Uh, in the past five years that I've been at Shopify, we've grown from around 40,000 merchants to well over 600,000 today. We handle merchants, both small and large, uh, small entrepreneurs that are just getting started to you know, big flash sellers like Kylie Jenner or Kanye West. So over the years, we've had to scale our infrastructure to keep up with kind of the ever-increasing number of merchants that we need to support. Today, um, I'm going to be talking about the biggest change that we've ever made, really, which is moving from our data centers to the cloud. So to give you just a rough idea of some, some core Shopify numbers, uh, the platform at peak, we handle around 80,000 requests per second. This is usually during some of our larger flash sales. Um, we have over 600,000 merchants, like I just mentioned. In 2017, we made roughly $26 billion US dollars in gross merchandise volume, or GMV. What this is, is the amount of money that's flowing through the platform from our customers to our merchants. Um, we have over 800 developers across the entire company. And the Shopify core monolith, we deploy it over 40 times a day. So Shopify is a multi-tenant architecture where each tenant is a shop that's run by a merchant. Uh, the infrastructure, it's all shared across all of our shops. The application that we call Shopify core, it's a monolith and it's what powers the majority of the merchant and customer experience. So the application itself is written in Ruby. Um, Shopify Core is one of the oldest and largest Ruby on Rails applications in existence. Um, the first commit was made sometime in 2005. Uh, this is well before Ruby was at uh, 1.0. We use MySQL as our primary data store. Uh, Memcache is our main cache that we use. Redis for more caching, but with fancy data structures. Um, and finally, Nginx is our load balancer and reverse proxy, and we also use it for some other cool optimizations as well. Um, we use some other things like uh, Kafka and Zookeeper, um, but I'm not really gonna be talking about them too much here. So the talk's kind of broken up into two parts. Part one, I'm gonna talk about the pre-cloud infrastructure uh, and how it's evolved over the years. This is gonna help build context so you can understand the how and why of the cloud move and give you an idea of what we did. Part two is more about the actual cloud move. So this is roughly what Shopify looked like in 2013. We have these uh, web workers, which uh, they run a Ruby application that's called Unicorn, uh, and that those are used for interactive processing. Then we have job workers, which run another Ruby application called Rescue, and that's used for background job processing. So all of these workers are talking to a single MySQL database, and that's hosting all Shopify stores. So the diagram doesn't include Redis and Memcache, but at the time we had one Redis instance and we had a handful of uh, Memcache, Memcache D instances. So the problem with this architecture is we hit a point where we couldn't scale the database. Um, up until that point, we'd been buying these larger and larger databases, but eventually we, we hit the ceiling. We needed to horizontally scale at the database level. So another problem was that the database was a single point of failure. If a shop was running a heavy flash sale or if it had issued some bad queries through the API, these types of things, that would affect all shops. So we knew that this single database wasn't gonna scale going forward. In 2013, late 2013, we sharded Shopify. 
Looks really simple on a conference diagram in 2018, but back then, this was a major infrastructure project for us. It took over six months, and it was the largest thing that we'd ever done. So we shard by shop. So the shop ID is the sharding key that we use. Um, the majority of our customer and kind of merchant workloads, they're all scoped to a single shop. So what that means is like a customer will be browsing products or purchasing items from one shop, or the merchant is like fulfilling orders or adding new inventory all from a single shop. So our strategy for sharding, it's worked really well for us. Today we have over 100 shards, but back then we just had two. So by sharding, we were able to spread our merchants all across multiple shards. And so that improved isolation and it improved resiliency. So the other nice thing here is that we effectively reduced the scope of a failure domain. So now if one bad shop caused database problems, it didn't affect all the others. So up until 2015, we were all hosted out of a single data center. If a disaster struck, we would have been in really big trouble. Luckily, it didn't, but this was the year that we knew that we needed a disaster recovery story. So in 2015, we built, uh, we built our second data center. Initially, this was, this was run as kind of an active passive configuration where all traffic, it would flow to a single DC, and we had MySQL replication running between both data centers. The idea was that in an emergency, we could just flip over and all have all of our traffic route to the second data center. The downside of this active passive configuration was that we basically had this million dollar space heater that was running in our passive data center. We'd spent all of this money on the hardware and we weren't actually using it for anything. But we had a disaster recovery story. But see, running, out of, running all of the infrastructure out of a single active DC, it increased the likelihood that the passive uh, DC configuration, it could become rusty. So the concern was, like, if we actually needed to perform a failover, because the infrastructure, it wasn't being used, like, some other problem that could arise during a failover that would prevent it from succeeding or maybe even cause more problems. So to combat this infrastructure rot, um, we would perform these regular data center failovers every few months. So this is, like, this is the Shopify Network Operations Center. Um, it's not really, I think it's NASA, but um, this is pretty much what failovers felt like for us in 2015. Um, performing failovers, it was a real production. Um, we would schedule it for some weekend morning when the disruption for our merchants would, would be minimal, um, but unfortunately the disruption to production engineering was maximal. Um, we had this big checklist of items uh, and pretty much every team in the production engineering group had some step that they needed to perform. We also needed to take a certain amount of system-wide system downtime and schedule that, that downtime and communicate it with our merchants. So it was kind of a pain. But once we did complete a failover, like this was, this was what the feeling was like in the room. Everybody was happy. Um, and as much as I love hugging my colleagues, it's just this was not a sustainable system. So up until this point, we'd sharded MySQL, but we hadn't done any of the other data stores. So in 2016, we introduced the concept of a pod, which given how popular Kubernetes is, this is an unfortunate name. Um, so I, I'll try and call it a Shopify pod, but I may not. Um, but the idea here is that a Shopify pod, it's an isolated unit of one or more shops. The Shopify pod, it contains all of the state that's used by some number of shops. So for example, in this diagram, you've got pod one, it contains shops one, five, eight, 20, 22, two has three, four, six, seven, nine, you get the picture. In terms of implementation, this is kind of what it looked like. Um, each pod, it contains the data stores for all of the shops within it. Um, the podded data stores, they're completely isolated, and the web and job workers are a shared resource that any pod can talk to. So the reason why the web and job workers were shared was because we need to support events like flash sales. I don't know, does everybody in here know what a flash sale is? Um, I can just explain quickly. So a flash sale is when a merchant is selling a product that is usually in very high demand that a lot of people wanna buy at the same time. Um, this could be something like sneakers or it could be something like makeup, um, but it's something that drives a lot of traffic to our platform. And the idea is we want to be able to share this stateless compute capacity um, when the platform really needs it. So this pods architecture, this was another incremental step forward for us. And by leveraging pods, 
we were able to, to eventually modify our multi-data center architecture and change it from active-passive to active-active. So around the same time that we were working on the, the multi-DC project, this is when we really started to fall in love with um, Nginx and the OpenRESD project. Um, we'd been using Nginx as our front-end load balancer and reverse proxy for a long time. Um, and what the OpenRESD project allows is for Nginx to be scripted using Lua. The original motivation for this was to do HTTP request routing. Um, but since then, we've used it for that, along with like custom load balancing, throttling, caching. We use it for a whole bunch of other things. Um, we at Shopify love talking about this, and myself and some of my other colleagues, we've done a few conference talks, and I'd highly encourage you to, to check them out. They're posted online. So Shopify pods were what allowed us to go from active-passive to active-active, because now all of a shop's data, it all resides in a single pod, and that pod is active in a single data center. So this is kind of how it looks in practice. Um, let's say, for example, we have a request for a shop that's located in pod three. Um, we use Anycast to broadcast our IP addresses from both of our data centers. Then using Nginx and Lua, we can transparently route a client request between data centers so that no matter where that request, so basically it'll get to the right place no matter where the request is coming in. So for example, if that request comes in to data center one, it gets proxied over to data center two where pod three is actually residing. But if the request happened to come into data center two, it would just be routed to pod three, which exists in that data center. So this was a big win for resiliency as well, because now we're really able to run Shopify from more than one location. And we finally put our million dollar space heater to good use. Um, if there's a problem affecting one data center, that problem is pretty much isolated to that region and it doesn't have any impact on the other. So hopefully that is enough background context. Now we're gonna move on to pod two, which is you know, actually about the cloud move. But first we're gonna talk about some of the motivations. So why did we decide to do this? Uh, one of the core principles at Shopify is building for the long term. We wanna be a 100 year old company. Uh, in this case, moving to the cloud is what we think will allow us to support Shopify's future growth and scale. So one of the big reasons for moving to the cloud was to support uh, data storage and privacy requirements, and those can vary throughout the world. Back in 2016, we had our first big brush with this, um, and with this thing called Safe Harbor. What Safe Harbor would have done, it would have required us to have a separate European data center for our European merchants. Luckily, it ended up being extended, and we were able to work around it in different ways. But at the time, we flew over to Europe, we went and talked to dozens of different uh, data center sites and providers trying to get this thing up and running. We realized that it would be really difficult to do this ourselves, being as that we're based in Canada and having to go over to Europe and set up a team there. So really, we ended up kicking off an effort to get Shopify running into the cloud around this time. Moving to the cloud, it would allow us to kind of stand on the shoulders of giants um, companies like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, that all run these massive data centers instead of having to build our own. So luckily for us, this investment, it's already started to pay off now for these certain compliance, for certain compliance cases. And because of, because of the work that we've been doing in migrating to the cloud, we were able to say yes to a really special merchant just recently. So the Ontario Cannabis Store has the exclusive rights to distribute recreational marijuana in the province of Ontario. And Shopify recently won the contract to provide sales, uh, both online and in-store. But the OCS, it requires data to be stored in Canada, which is something that we would, have, we would have had a really hard time doing before our cloud move. And as we continue to go global, I think that we're gonna see different requirements around data storage and processing for other merchants as well. And being in the cloud is gonna make this a lot easier for us to deal with. So another big reason going to the cloud helps us build for the long term is by improving performance for our merchants around the world. To stay competitive with services in countries other than the United States, uh, we eventually need to bring Shopify physically closer to our merchants. Uh, with the existing data center architecture, merchants in Europe, in Australia, 
in Asia, they end up having a poorer experience using Shopify because requests have to traverse the internet all the way back to the United States to be served out of one of our data centers. So cloud providers like Google, they can help solve this problem for us. In this network map from Google, you can see that it pretty much, they pretty much have data centers almost everywhere, all around the world, everywhere that we need to be. And the nice thing is that we're really not limited to using Google as our only cloud provider. There's a number of others that also have worldwide data centers. So leveraging these worldwide cloud data centers, they let it, that, that's what lets us stand up new instances of Shopify far more easily than if we had to build these data centers ourselves. Moving to the cloud is gonna allow Shopify to be closer to our merchants and their customers all around the world. This is gonna improve their experience and make our merchants more successful. Shopify is also becoming less of a monolith. The Ruby on Rails app, it's the largest app that we operate at Shopify, but as we grow, we're breaking out and creating, we're, we're creating new functionality in more and more separate apps. I'm not really talking about it too much in this presentation, but there are plenty of other internal applications that we have outside of Shopify core. This slide, it shows the number of um, new internal applications from 2016, you really can't read that, to uh, April of 2018. Um, but you can see the trend and it's pretty obvious. As we keep growing, we keep building more and more apps. So up until uh, the cloud move, there were three separate ways that you could run an application. Um, you could run it in the data center, but this required support from production engineering to provision the hardware. Uh, you needed experience in writing chef scripts uh, or chef cookbooks. It had a really high barrier to entry. You had Amazon, lower barrier to entry than running in the data center, but still required domain knowledge. And finally, there was Heroku, which was really, it's a really easy way to get started building an application, but it can be difficult to scale once you're in production. So each one of these, they have their own benefits and drawbacks, but the fact that they're different, it introduces cognitive overhead for both developers and for production engineering. So by having this single consistent cloud platform, we now have one way to build and operate all of our applications at Shopify. So simplicity was one of the, is the last motivator for our cloud move. So in the 19th century, it wasn't uncommon for a factory to have its own power plant. And this is before electrification became common. Um, there were a lot of different competing standards. The grid wasn't reliable. For us, this is somewhat analogous to operating our own data center. Operating data centers, it requires uh, a lot of effort and a lot of expertise. Uh, you need people in the data center to physically manage the equipment. You need subject matter experts uh, in areas like networking, computer design. Uh, you need to worry about procurement. You need to worry about depreciating hardware, network providers, so on. Um, historically, uh, the production engineering group at Shopify, we spent a significant amount of time and engineering effort around the Black Friday, Cyber Monday holiday season, buying new hardware, racking it, provisioning it, and all of that. This is not the business that Shopify wants to be in. Moving to the cloud is what allows us to simplify our business by removing one significant infrastructure concern. The ubiquity of cloud computing, it allows us to abstract away the data center and let us focus more on our primary business concern, that is creating more successful entrepreneurs. So now, we can simply pass our capacity estimates onto our provider, and it's their problem. Um, and even better, after the holiday season is over, we can just turn all those computers off. So that was our list of motivations. We had compliance, performance, consistency, and simplicity. All of those things are what are gonna help us build for the long term. But how did we actually execute this cloud move? So it all started with hack days. Shopify has a quarterly hack days event. Uh, over two days, R&D at the company stops. Uh, teams are formed. They can work on new ideas. A lot of these ideas become products. And in 2016, we put together a team to try to get Shopify running on Kubernetes. Uh, the project was a success. We were able to get a small test shop up and running. So back in 2014, we'd started to look into containerization. Um, for better and worse, we, we, better or worse, we ended up using Docker. Uh, however, at the time, we found that container scheduling, it was a little bit immature. So we ended up writing our own orchestrator, which really was a bunch of chef cookbooks, but it got the job done. Um, 
You fast forward to 2017, and Kubernetes is all the rage. Um, after spending a bunch of time prototyping, investigating, uh, we decided to fully invest in Kubernetes for our infrastructure. So the Shopify pods architecture, it made it really quite simple to add a new data center in the cloud. Uh, using the Nginx request routing layer, it was easy to route requests to shops that were running in this new cloud region that we created. All we really needed to do was just create a new upstream that represented that cloud region. Nothing really changed from the edge perspective. Uh, all client requests are still routed to one of the data centers. The difference is, is if a request comes that's for a shop that's in the cloud, it's gonna be routed to the cloud pod instead of to one of the data centers. So how did we actually move all of these shops to the cloud? Um, it was pretty straightforward for us to create test shops and cloud pods, uh, but for all of the other shops, we moved them one at a time. Um, and how did we do that? We built a tool that we creatively named the Shop Mover. Um, the Shop Mover is this tool that we built that facilitates moving pods between, or moving shops between pods, between Shopify pods. So moving a shop, it's not trivial. Data needs to be copied from one database to another. Uh, you can't lose any updates. You can't corrupt any data, obviously. Uh, we need to transfer all of the shop's background jobs, update its shard ID, clean up old data. There's a whole bunch of things that we need to do. And all of this needs to be done with minimal downtime for the merchant. It also needs to be automated. Because we have thousands, hundreds of thousands of shops to move, uh, the amount of manual work that we need to do, it really needs to be minimized. So Ghost Ferry is uh, it's an open source library that we built that can perform online data copying between MySQL instances. So it works by selecting data from a source database and then inserting it into a target and applying bin log changes that are happening at the same time. Uh, it also performs uh, validations during the data migration to ensure correctness. Uh, it's available on GitHub. I'll have a link at the end so you can check it out. And how did we select what order to move the shops? Uh, it was basically at random. Um, we select a bunch of shops, we put them into a move queue, then we have this pre-configured number of shop mover tasks that are pulling shops off of that queue and then moving them in parallel. So at a high level, this is kind of how it works. It's kind of hard to read. Um, first, we kick off a new move. Uh, we'll perform some validations to ensure that uh, the move can begin, and we'll start it. Assuming everything is good to go, we start by setting up bin log replication from the source to the target. Then we begin that process of selecting the data from the source and inserting it to the target. This is where the bulk of the move time is being spent. So once we've completed that copy, we wait for the bin log to catch up. And once Ghost Ferry determines that replication is sufficiently caught up, we'll wait for any existing jobs running on the shop to complete. Then we stop all writes to the shop. At this point, the shop is immutable. Uh, functionality like performing checkouts or updating the shop itself, those are gonna be disabled, but the storefront is still available and customers are still able to browse the merchant site. Then we're gonna wait for the final replication for for replication to complete between the source and the target. Then we'll switch the shard ID, we'll re-enable writes, and the shop move is pretty much complete at that point. So this kind of demonstrates the, the shop moving process. On the left are the shops that are in the data center, and then on the right you can see how we moved shops over to, uh, to most, of the, most of the shops over to the cloud. So earlier I had this slide talking about the, the, that successful failover feeling. Um, and like I said, this is, as much as I love it, it's just not sustainable. So thanks to this pods architecture that we have, um, we were able to refine how we performed failovers. So rather than performing failovers at the data center layer, we were now able to perform uh, failovers at the pod layer. And the tool that we built to uh, perform these failovers, uh, we called it um, active failover. So this is an example of a real life failover from, uh, from a few weeks ago. Uh, in this case, the, the user's running this command, uh, spy, which is the name of our chat ops bot, spy failover 
uh, Shopify pod one to Ash. So as you can imagine, uh, this, what this is doing, it's initiating a failover from pod one, which is running uh, in our Chicago data center, uh, over, to Ashburn, uh, over to our Ashburn, Virginia data center. The bot, it requires, a bit of, it requires confirmation to kick off the failover, uh, and then once confirmed, it starts. Um, it emits some dashboard links uh, so that the user can check for status and make sure that everything's going okay, and then once the failover completes, it prints a success message. So the user experience here is really awesome, and there are no more manual steps to follow. It more or less just works, and there's no more hugging. Um, as we continue to grow, we keep adding more and more pods. Um, so in the case of a regional outage, moving these pods individually, it can be really tedious and possibly error prone. So we recently created this new spy evacuate command that effectively allows us to perform a full regional failover over Slack. So when you run one of these failovers, um, what actually happens? So first, we're gonna, we're gonna perform some sanity checks, just like with the shop mover. Um, this is gonna make sure that all of the tools are working and that the target region is uh, up and running and available. Then we're gonna update the location of the pod in our global data store. So at this point, we're gonna leverage our, our Nginx and Lua layer by effectively pausing all inbound client requests at the load balancer. This is what allows us to kind of minimize the number of failed requests we see during the actual failover. Then we do the MySQL failover, which is basically just toggling the read-only flag in both regions. So in the source region, we're gonna set, the, we're gonna set MySQL to be read-only, and in the target, we're gonna change it to read-write. At this point, we're gonna unpause requests, and from the point of view of the merchant and customer, the failover is now complete. But once that's done, we still need to do some cleanup in the source region, um, and then transfer any outstanding background jobs over to the new target location. And once that's done, the pod failover is complete. So I've made it look so far, I think that you know, everything is rainbows and unicorns and like this whole thing has been really, really easy, uh, but we've actually had quite a few problems. So initially there was a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt around the cloud move. Um, it slowed us down a lot, and to a certain extent, I think it, it held us back from executing as quickly as we could have. Um, one of the reasons we wanted to move to the cloud was to get out of the data center building business, but that does come with its own set of trade-offs, and one uh, big area of uncertainty for us was database performance. Um, our databases need to be able to handle these short bursts of really high throughput during flash sales. Uh, so in the database, we, or sorry, in the data center, we have these huge beefy databases. They have tons of memory. They have really fast SSDs. We control all of the hardware. Um, but we weren't sure if we could get that kind of performance from cloud database offerings. So we spent a bunch of time um, looking at managed SQL uh, options, found that the performance wasn't good enough for us. Um, in, test, in doing our synthetic benchmarks with, against VMs, we found that the performance was acceptable, but you know, synthetic benchmarks is really not the same as real production traffic. So we went into the project with uh, very little experience operating Kubernetes. Um, so to mitigate some of this risk, we spent time investigating running Kubernetes in our own data center. So this gave us, um, this gave us the benefit of, of giving us hands-on uh, experience running Kubernetes. Uh, and it was kind of like a potential path forward if we weren't able to get the performance that we needed out of the cloud uh, databases. We could maybe even just run Kubernetes in the data center. But this took us some time and um, it just took us a while to build up uh, that confidence. So another, uh, another big unknown was just the cloud infrastructure itself. Uh, we were comfortable operating in the data center because we'd built it ourselves, we'd operated it for years. But moving to the cloud environment, it would introduce a whole set of problems, a lot of which we could never predict in advance. So the biggest problem I'd say that we ran into uh, during this migration was scaling our Kubernetes clusters. Um, I'm gonna get into a little bit of Kubernetes stuff now, so hopefully everybody has context. If not, I apologize. 
Um, the Shopify core Kubernetes workload, it requires, um, it requires thousands of nodes, and we run thousands of pods. Kubernetes pods, that is. Um, so this is kind of a high-level uh, overview of the, our initial Kubernetes cluster architecture. Uh, it's pretty similar to what we had in the data center, except that it's running in Kubernetes. Uh, the one exception is uh, MySQL, which is running in its, own, in its own VMs, like I mentioned before. So we knew long-term that this architecture, that it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to scale. Um, we knew that for the Black Friday, Cyber Monday holiday season of this year, uh, that we would, have to, we would have to drastically scale up our compute to be able to handle the load. And from talking to our cloud provider, we knew that this architecture just wasn't going to work for that. But what we didn't really know is that we'd need to re-architect before completing our initial migration. So once our uh, cluster grew beyond a certain size, uh, we started to run into load issues on etcd and Kubernetes API server. So the internet has a bunch of different information on Kubernetes cluster scaling. And in the end, like what works, uh, what works for you, it all really depends on your workload. Uh, it's possible to scale a single cluster up to 5,000 nodes, but if you're doing that, your cluster is probably running like one pod per node. That pod is probably being updated like never, and the cluster is probably not really doing anything else. Um, our workload, it runs uh, tens of pods per node. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we deploy Shopify about 40 times a day during core business hours. So we're literally restarting pods, like thousands of pods every few minutes. Um, you can also tune Kubernetes. Uh, you can tune the API server in etcd for more performance, but for us, this wasn't really an option um, because we're running, uh, we're running with a, a hosted Kubernetes provider and we have really limited access to the control plane. So what we were trying to figure out was how do we actually break apart our workload into multiple clusters so that we could horizontally scale it. So we spent uh, a bunch of time um, trying to look at how can we actually, uh, how can we do this? And what we decided was we wanted to break the cluster into stateful and stateless components, but we couldn't figure out how to communicate between those clusters. So as long as, as Kubernetes pods are running in the same network, they can talk to each other. But the problem was uh, our VPC network had become so large that we were running out of network route entries and hitting quota limits. Every time we added a new node to the cluster, um, we would consume another route. And once we were up to thousands of nodes, we started to hit these route limits, and we got to the point where we couldn't actually add any more nodes to the cluster. And finally, we needed a way to perform service discovery between clusters. Uh, Kubernetes service objects, they work really well for service discovery within a cluster, but there's no out-of-the-box way to do service discovery in, in other clusters. So to solve the route limit problem, we were able to use this GKE feature called IP aliasing. Um, this allows um, a cluster's pod IP range to be reserved from a predefined CIDR block. The benefit is that um, nodes in a cluster with IP aliasing enabled, they don't use any more route quota. The downside was that IP aliasing, it can't be enabled on existing clusters, so we had to rebuild all of our clusters to enable it. Um, at one point, uh, ironically, we weren't, actually to cre we weren't able to create new clusters because we had no more routes, um, so we had to get a quota, like we had to get a loan to get our route usage down so that we could actually create new clusters. Uh, Cross-cluster service discovery, this was another tough one to solve. Uh, we, thought of a bunch of, um, we thought of a bunch of different solutions. None of them really worked quite right. Uh, in the end, we discovered that we could put uh, an internal load balancer in front of a cluster's cube DNS service. So what this, what this kind of looks like in practice is, is something like this where we have an ILB that is sitting in front of a cube DNS service that's running in the stateful cluster. That ILB, it has a known IP address. Then from the stateless clusters, we can set up a stub domain that's pointing to that ILB so that any DNS queries that are targeting that stub domain, they get forwarded to the DNS service that's running in the stateful cluster. So it's kind of hard to see from here, but like for example, if you were doing a, a DNS request for uh, redis-pod1-1.redis.cluster, that request would be forwarded to the ILB running at 10.0.0.10 and then resolved in that stateful cluster and then the pod IP would be returned to the stateless cluster. So now the, our multi-cluster architecture looks something like this, where we have 
uh, Redis and Memcache services that are running in their own cluster, and they can be accessed from the stateless clusters through ILBs. And now we can horizontally scale our stateless clusters, and really we expect that this architecture is going to last us for the foreseeable future. So one important thing to note is that uh, without having active failover here, uh, these cluster migrations, they would have been far more difficult, if not impossible. Uh, we were able to do all of this work live in production without taking any downtime by basically just draining an entire region of all of its Shopify pods, rebuilding the clusters in the, in the inactive region, and then moving them back once we'd recreated the new clusters. So another problem we have um, is that kubectl, which is the command that is used to control Kubernetes clusters, it's a really big hammer. Um, coming from data centers where we did configuration management with Chef, uh, we were used to convergence taking maybe 30 minutes or so to converge across the entire fleet. So this meant that if you'd made a mistake that had somehow passed CI, it would only affect a few nodes. But with kubectl, convergence is basically instant. So it's kind of like if you're running a SQL um, delete statement and then forgetting the where clause. If you mistype a command or you provide a bad argument, it's easily going to take down, it could easily take down your entire infrastructure. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say it, but this actually happened to us on more than one occasion. Um, you need to really use kubectl with, with care. So one way we were able to reduce our usage of kubectl was by building a tool called Kubernetes Deploy. Uh, this is a tool that helps you uh, safely apply changes to a, uh, to a Kubernetes namespace. We use it for deploying new versions of Shopify. Uh, it's kind of like kubectl apply, but with a lot more power. Uh, why would you want to use it? Um, it watches the state of the cluster to make sure that the changes you're trying to apply to make sure that they're successful. So running kubectl apply is kind of like a fire and forget sort of thing. You're, told, you're telling the, cu the cluster this is the state that you want to be in, but you don't actually know when you get to that state. So if, there, if you're running Kubernetes deploy, um, if there are any problems getting to that state, Kubernetes deploy is going to tell you and provide information on anything that would have failed. Another nice thing is it can pre-deploy any dependent resources. So this could be useful if you have something like a persistent volume claim that's going to be consumed by something else that you're deploying. It'll make sure that that PVC is set up before you try and deploy the other thing that depends on it. And it also has the ability to run tasks at the beginning of a deployment, um, which we use for doing things like running Rails migrations. So, Wow, you can't see that at all. Um, to use Kubernetes deploy, uh, what you do is you define a bunch of YAML templates that defines, um, and that describes all of the resources that are used by your application. So these templates, they allow you to programmatically define um, your, your Kubernetes resources. This lets you do things like deploy a certain revision of your code. Then you can use uh, our eJSON uh, encryption library to st also store encrypted secrets in your, uh, in your repository, and those secrets can be picked up by Kubernetes deploy as well. So when you're ready to deploy a new version of your application, you just execute the command line tool and it will roll out a new version of your app. So I really rushed through because I only have so much time, but there were a lot of other problems that we had as well, uh, but I just don't have time. Um, so I'm just going to kind of wrap this up with uh, some of the, more, the most important lessons that we learned during this migration. So maintaining two infrastructures is really hard. What this guy is doing is what's called Roman riding. He's riding two horses at the same time, and that's kind of like running in both the data center and in the cloud. Uh, we have two horses. They're both running. Uh, sometimes they're running in different directions, and we need to stay upright and in control. Uh, the cognitive overhead for operating two infrastructures is really high, um, and we spent a lot of time running on both, which made it really hard and caused confusion and a few mistakes. Another one that we learned was lift and shift. Um, there's a real value in, in performing lift and shift as a, like for infrastructure changes. What this means, I'd like, I like to say, is just try not to do too much at the same time. We did a lot at the same time. We migrated to Kubernetes, and we moved from the data center to the cloud. Just doing one of those things has its own challenges, but when you do two, you know, it's not like one and one is two. It's probably like one and one equals five or something like that, because it's a lot, you have a lot more problems. Um, on that note, you, you want to iterate. Um, don't try and do everything at once and ship everything in this kind of big bang thing. You want to perform small, intera small iterations, make incremental progress. Um, you want to make these kind of continual improvements to keep you motivated 
and it keeps you accountable as well. Um, and they st those little changes, they do start to accumulate. So like for us, for example, moving one shop at a time, you know, th those were really small wins. And before we knew it, we drained an entire, um, an entire database for, of Shopify pods and had them all running in the cloud. And finally, this, one, this one's nothing new. Uh, but if there's something that you need to do more than once or regularly, you got to automate it. Uh, there's no way we would have been successful had we not automated a large part of our tooling. Um, along with the automation, we're also big, uh, big believers in chat ops. Being able to control your infrastructure through chat, it's kind of like a forcing function for simplicity of, of tooling, and it can help provide uh, transparency and, and it can help clarify communication uh, during incidents. So that's all I've got. I know it was a lot. Uh, thank you uh, very much for listening, and also we are hiring.